All right. Welcome, everyone, to another Deliberations Live. I'm your host. I'm back this week, Derek Caldwell, and I'm with author and speaker Abdu Murray. Abdu, it's great to be here with you again. Great to have you back, man. Although you, you held it down really well last week with I Lance. I held something down. I had yeah. to keep it down. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but it was, uh, it was fun, challenging. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lance was uh, also helpful in keeping it, keep, keep things running, running and rolling. And I have a very um, uh, sort of a, not a newfound, but a deepened appreciation of you keeping it together, reading stuff while <laughs> trying to talk with us and all that. So thank yeah, you for doing yeah. what you do. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a, it's a real um, pleasure. I, d I noticed we did get on last week's Deliberations Live, we did get a lot of comments of people saying, hey, we really miss the other guy. Where's the other guy? It was so much better but i did i did tell my mom to stop flooding our our youtube <laughs> channel um but we're gonna jump in uh because we got a lot of questions to get to and actually we may be by the end of this episode talking a lot about the concept of hell as well yes because you had a a reel that came out mm -hmm. uh was it this week or last week i think um, it was last week we had an instagram reel yeah. and it was also on our facebook page on the idea of hell and it got a yeah. lot of reaction yeah yeah, yeah. And so a lot of interesting questions i think a lot of people christian and non-christian alike uh have questions about so we'll we'll be able to get to that but um first so this is about the episode on uh bill maher mm -hmm. saying some some things about jesus being based on pagan myths yeah this is no new argument it's mm -hmm. been debunked for a while but it comes back and 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 sort of new versions here and there sure does um and and this was first presented to me in an undergrad class at one of my secular university mm -hmm. as truth from a philosophy uh, professor and there were christians in that class really struggling with it i didn't know how to answer it at the time mm -hmm. Um, being a relatively new Christian, so this is this is out there, and that was back in two thousand six or two thousand seven. Yeah. So it's been around. Um, we're trying to get answers out there, but uh, but yeah. So I want to first ask. You know, there was a a, a question that uh, actually our buddy Lance uh, sent us. Mm -hmm. uh, that that, and we've got a lot more questions to get to. But I, I thought this one was really good. Do you believe that acknowledging any similarities between Jesus and pagan myths? Uh, undermines the uniqueness and divinity of Jesus? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think the answer is is, is no for a number of reasons. Um, in fact, let me suggest that as he highlights it. <clears throat> uh, and we may have actually talked about this during the episode. I'm not sure if we did or didn't. But um, one of the things that I think is really important to recognize is that um, we have a, I won't say a universal human experience, but we have common human experiences. Mm -hmm. and We have certain themes and ideas that speak to us, that resonate with us. Um, <clears throat> and there are scholars who point this out. I think Norman Parent uh, is, is is such a scholar who talks about the fact or that- Nicholas, he, Nicholas. Nicholas Sorry, Parent, yeah. not Norman. Norman yeah, Parent yeah. someone else. Lost actually. in Translation is yes. a book he talks about it. Yeah. yeah, and he talks about this idea that we have these, um, these certain motifs and these certain themes that speak to human experience. We have uh, uh, heroes and people who, uh, and redemption and uh, maybe even vicarious redemption mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of uh, sort of at the last minute all seeming loss and then suddenly something breaks through in a miraculous way. Mm -hmm. We have these ideas. This is not a unique uh, thing that's unique to Christianity um, in the broad sense. The details, I think, actually are quite unique to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what, what he points out, and I think we ought to pay attention to, is the fact that if we were to see something so unique about the Christian message that it might not be relatable. Mm -hmm. So it's so unique that it's like, wow, there's right. nothing like this in any kind of story whatsoever. It's like, yeah, but then who does it apply to? What need is it trying to fulfill? What human condition uh, is it describing if it's not common to the human condition? And so the Christian message might have some parallels with other myths, um, which are actually mythical um, mm -hmm. or mythological, uh, but still be true. Because those myths are uh, humanity's attempt to create a story that makes sense of a world and the needs that human beings face. Yeah. The Christian faith uh, speaks to those same exact needs because <clears throat> those needs exist. Let me put it this way. Those myths exist because it is the human effort to try to satisfy uh, the longing we have, the existential longing we have for answers to those things that we struggle with. It would be odd if God did not provide a, an actual historical way for those same needs to be met, but in a historically true actual way. So 
yeah, there are possibly, and I think that those parallels are quite uh, uh, quite tenuous at best, but there would be some parallel themes and some parallel ideas, uh, but doesn't speak to their lack of truth. It just speaks to the fact that, uh, sorry, it doesn't speak to the lack of truth of the Christian faith. It speaks to the fact that these are yearnings within us. And because the Christian faith actually provides us with historical anchoring for believing that God did something to satisfy those yearnings, um, should not surprise us. In fact, it would surprise us if he didn't do that. And so acknowledging parallel themes where they actually exist does not undermine the Christian faith. In fact, it actually supports it because you'd expect if God exists for him to answer the felt needs that we as human beings have. So I don't, I'm not worried about that in the slightest bit, yeah. but we have to make sure we continue with the careful work of saying, are these things actually parallel enough where you might get some suspicion that this story borrowed from this story? And that's a matter of the evidence. But the themes, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest bit. In fact, it would surprise me if they didn't have any parallels. Yeah, yeah that's um, a great point. And actually, um, really transitions well into the uh, question that we received from Gregory. And by the way, hello, Gregory. Thank you for the welcome back. And uh, Sam as well. I spent Thank you as well. I did have a good vacation in Cape Cod. Mm. I recommend everyone go there. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, I think Sharn, Sharni, Sharnay, uh, listening from Cape Town, South Africa. Sorry, I butchered that. I hope one of those three versions was correct. But we appreciate you. Uh, We're close to correct. Appreciate you <laughs> tuning in, which I don't think that makes sense for watching something on online. But tuning in is still the the term you've I like to your use. You've tuned your you've mind. Tuned your mind. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You haven't tuned out, so that's good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks for joining in. Um, but Gregory asked a, uh, a question. So did Sam. We'll get to Sam's question here in a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gregory asked this question. Wouldn't a uh, lack of motive on the part of the disciples be another issue with this theory that Jesus was made up and based on ancient myths? And he goes on to talk about really no one would have thought to, to bring up this idea make up a story like this that what your savior who was also god died yeah uh, this is unfathomable mm -hmm. and i remember a comment from uh michael bird i believe it was yeah, who um he was writing in a book called how god became jesus which was a response to bart ehrman's book how jesus became god and he mm -hmm. said if, if this was such a commonplace thing because Ehrman doesn't try to say Jesus was based on pagan myths. He says he was based on people like Peregrinus, mm -hmm. which I have an article about on our website, yep. or Roman emperors, the deification of the of the emperors and things mm -hmm. like that. But Michael Bird said, well, if that's the case, that it was so common, mm -hmm. why did people react so violently against it? Why was it foolishness to the Greeks if they all believe this kind of stuff could happen anyway? And it happened all the time and people were going up to heaven, coming mm -hmm. down from heaven and and such a stumbling block to Jews if they believe the same thing. Yeah. Um, what, what do you, I mean, when we look back, we really do see reactions of this is not based off anything. It really, like the fact that, is it, do you think it's the fact that they, Christians took it seriously or was it really that different or both? Yeah. yeah and this is a, I think this is an <clears throat> instance of where an argument proves too much. <laughs> um, and this happens in law courts all the time where someone presents evidence and that evidence and actually ends up being so strong that it undermines their central claim because it actually goes to if it was such good evidence or if it was such um, uh, it, because it's such good evidence, maybe the obviousness of the fact you're trying to prove would would just say but no one would react the way you're claiming they would react your claim make, makes no sense. So if it were the case that these kinds of themes were so common that Christianity is just one variety among the many varieties, uh, it's one carrot in a row of carrots planted in the same uh, in the same garden, and it just looks a little different because the stalk is a little higher or the little green feathery thing at the top of it looks a little higher, why would it garner such a reaction? Like, no, no, this one carrot, this is the one, this is the one that mm -hmm. matters the most, even though it looks like everything else. Yeah. That's a great point. I think Michael Bird's point is well taken, um, is that it seems to me that there's got to be something unique. And they didn't. And what's interesting to me is the critic usually will go to the to the length of saying there's almost nothing unique about the Christian faith, is that it's plucked things from all these different myths, put them together in this sort of like weird stew. Uh, but it's so common that it's almost so savory, it's palatable to the ancient world, and they could just eat it easily. Mm -hmm. 
But if that's the case, then it wouldn't have had the effect it did. It wouldn't have had the galvanizing effect it did on a minority church to be able to spread this quickly and this well within a pagan culture already. Um, Because that's one of the critiques, too, is you have folks who are saying, look, you have a Hellenized um, uh, uh, Judea. It's run, it's run by the Romans. It's heavily influenced by the Greeks. And so you have these constant ideas of these uh, various gods running around and God man and all this stuff. And you got all this going on. Uh, why would you expect, you know, there to be any savor then to the Christian faith popping up and having the impact it did? Mm-hmm. It polarized people. It polarized the Jews. It polarized the Romans. It polarized the Greeks. Like you were saying, um, that we, not only does the Bible tell us this, but you have an outbreak of persecution against Christians in reaction to the Christian mm-hmm. message. If it was just like everything else, then it wouldn't have garnered that kind of reaction. So uh, interestingly enough, I see a bit of a parallel between something else, by the way, if, if I can just digress for a moment yeah. on something that's a little bit different <clears throat> from the topic at hand, but I think it's worth speaking about. I was doing a debate uh, a few years ago at Western Michigan University with John Loftus on the resurrection of Jesus. And one of the um, complaints or critiques, I should say, that uh, John has about the gospel accounts <clears throat> of the resurrection narrative is that Matthew has the the body being stolen um, and then this, what he says, a ridiculous lie concocted by the Jewish leaders to for the Roman um, soldiers to lie and say, we fell asleep on the job, and when we woke up, the body was gone. The disciples stole the body. And he's like, this is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of thing that's absolutely unbelievable because the Jewish leaders would have no influence over Roman soldiers, and that lie is a terrible lie anyway because the, the authorities would want to kill, have those soldiers executed, no matter what these Jews, who the Romans didn't think much of, would have said anyway. They had no influence. Yeah. Of course, that, that ignores some facts. And one of those facts is that it's lar- it's probably not a Roman guard that's in front of that in front of that tomb. It's probably a Jewish guard. Hmm. In fact, when Pilate says, you have a guard, go make it safe, he's not saying, go take a bunch of Romans. Go take the temple guard. Yeah. Because the temple guards were the one who took Jesus in the first place. The Romans didn't show up in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the Jewish temple guard who showed up there. Yeah. So... Yes, he do have influence. So the story makes a lot more sense when you when you consider that. But Loftus's point was interesting because he was trying to say that <clears throat> no one would believe this story. They would, the story. The fabrication of the story would be instantly obvious to Jews and Romans alike, this sort of fantastic idea. Mm-hmm. But he just got done saying earlier on in his book and even in, his, in the debate, I think it was, where he said that, People believed in ideas like rising gods and people rising from the dead in <laughs> miracles because they're inherently gullible. Mm-hmm. So my question during the Q&A crossfire was, wait a minute, they're not so gullible that they wouldn't believe a story about guards falling asleep, which is perfectly plausible. Mm-hmm. But they are too, so gullible that they would believe someone rising from the dead. Mm-hmm. Which one is it? Are they gullible or are they not gullible? <laughs> right. Um, and so... Yeah. That's part of it. You test the claim. So the question is, is is the Christian faith just like everything else? And so it would have no real impact historically, or is it so unique that it had a world changing effect? It's probably the second one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's, um, and that's again to the, there is this sort of, um, you've mentioned it before, the sort of the ad hoc way people want to make arguments against Christianity. It's sort mm-hmm. of this argument works here, so I, I think, so I like it, and this one works here, I like it. Like, mm-hmm. and But sometimes if you take some time to look at, put their arguments together and see, sometimes there are some real inconsistencies yeah. uh, with with those. So that's yeah. uh, fascinating, That which is, and that's often the case with, because the, 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 the apostles, either these dumb fishermen who could never have written the New Testament, or they're these shrewd myth makers who understood all of this ancient pagan mythology and yeah. and and put together this myth that captured the imaginations of the whole uh, Greek world. And um, yeah, you know what? Which is it? Are, yeah, are they only, geniuses or are they imbeciles from the backwaters? Absolutely. Not only do they have the ability to make these intricate cross references to their own scriptures by writing things that were mm-hmm. artfully either veiled or overt references to those old scriptures, but they knew so much about pagan culture, mm-hmm. non Jewish <clears throat> culture, and religious beliefs that they could make cross references to them as well. <clears throat> and somehow 
concoct something that changed the world. Yeah. I think that that's exactly, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got um, a question from, we actually, so Sam asked a question here and there's um, another one uh, on hello, Carol from Oregon state. I'd love to get to Oregon too. It's a beautiful place. Oh, and and Philip and uh, again from South Africa. So we got a couple from, Fantastic. from South Africa today. Hey, South Africa. Um, uh, but Sam asked a question, and there was a similar one on YouTube. So um, on, on YouTube, the question was, um, how exactly, is it good work, how exactly did they go about dragging our Lord's birth into a pagan ritual time in December? Mm -hmm. And um, someone responded and said, well, Constantine, mm -hmm. uh, combining uh, religions. And then Sam asked uh, the same thing, you know, how much, well, Sam's being curious, he's, how much influence did Constantine have? on this and mingling Christianity with other religions and these um, holidays uh, rising up and mm -hmm. he's, you know, concerned, should we be celebrating uh, Christmas? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> it's funny because normally these questions come up around Easter or Christmas. Yeah. And here we are in uh, almost in June. So neither one of those is close. One yeah. is past. Well, but Easter's it's almost close ish. But yeah, but it's interesting because it is like, OK, you're saying mm -hmm. These claims aren't based on anything, but look, we even see afterwards they're still using these pagan myths yeah. and pagan rituals to try and give meaning to this Jesus thing. Like, if he had a real birthday, why didn't they just celebrate that one instead of saying it was, uh, yeah, yeah, well, December twenty fifth? I think that that's a great question. I think that the answer lies at a couple a couple of places. I think one is you got to make a, a, an important distinction between concocting an entire faith tradition. So if you, if the Gospels was based on pagan mythology, what you're saying is the central message of the Christian faith is no different than the pagan myths of, um, well, the, the, the elements of other pagan myths and their central message. But the Gospel has a unique message. So it's one thing completely to say that the Gospel message isn't really unique at all. It's just... Uh, a, a different trapping or a different dress around common myths. It's another thing to say that there are certain dates celebrated that give meaning and they happen to coincide with, or they purposely coincided with um, pagan uh, um, <coughs> ritualistic observances. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing altogether. Those are two different things. The yeah. origin of the Christian faith versus the so, sort of ceremonial trappings of the Christian faith. Those are two different things. So if you say, think of the non sequitur, if you say that the celebration of Christmas is somehow pagan in origin because of the date um, associated with it and the idea of the winter solstice and all this stuff, um, that even if that were true, you're not saying, you, that, that does nothing to prove that the Christian message itself isn't true because it's historically based and the message is vouchsafed by this history. So it's a non sequitur to say this one holiday happens to have some kind of pagan affinities mm -hmm. um, or, or um, similarities. So therefore, the message does, too. That's just not a that doesn't right. logically follow. Right. However, having said that, so that's one thing. Make sure you make sure you focus on that. I think the next thing to understand, though, is that <clears throat> uh, if you think of the gospel narrative, and this again goes in some senses of the credibility, the gospel narrative is that God in flesh was born to peasants who in Bethlehem who were from Nazareth. And you wouldn't have like a bunch of records running around and they didn't celebrate birthdays <laughs> mm -hmm. necessarily the way we celebrate birthdays now. And, yeah, correct. Um, yeah. It's, it's not like what we have today where I know exactly when my birth date was because there's a gift, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a birth certificate and a record of it. I'll give you an example in the Middle East, even relatively recently. Now it's changed since then, but I have relatives who passed away relatively recently who did not know their actual birthday. They have no idea what their actual birthday actually is. They think it's probably in the summer because it was hot. Mm -hmm. And the reason was is because they didn't, you know, 90 years ago, they didn't record things in the villages mm -hmm. of Lebanon the way they record them now. Mm -hmm. or the way they recorded them in the United States even 90 years ago. They just yeah. didn't do it that same way. So the birthday wasn't as important. Right. That you were born, yeah. terribly important. When it was exactly you were born, not celebrated like it is yeah. here. Um, so you, would, you wouldn't expect that to be the kind of thing you'd know. So the birth event, of course, is terribly important. Um, if the Gospels are to be giving any credit whatsoever, 
whether historical or otherwise, you see the importance attached to the birth narrative, of course, when the host of the heavenlies comes in and says, you know, that uh, essentially peace on earth is born this to you this day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's clearly an important day, um, but the day itself is not marked. So later, I think that Christians wanted to make sure that this was something that um, people who are not Christian were understanding and commemorating whether he was born in April or he was born um, in December wasn't the point. The right. point was Jesus is the Jesus is the true fulfillment of that which you've mythologized. Uh, so it goes back to this whole element. We have this desire in the middle of the doldrums of winter where there's nothing but gray and death and all these things mm -hmm. of a hope of something beautiful being born. Yeah. And so you have <clears throat> across various religious traditions and mythological traditions, the celebration of this like solstice where the days are not getting shorter anymore. Now they're getting longer. And so it's going to be a rebirth coming and coming soon. Um, and so you have this idea that rebirth is coming. Um, so that's a very natural human thing. And God steps in and says, that thing you're longing for, I've actually done. Mm -hmm. um, th does it happen to be at December 25th? No. Um, is it around then? I have no idea. But their point was that this is the day he was born. That was never the, Christ, uh, the, the mm -hmm. Christian message's point. The point was this thing you are hoping for is actually fulfilled in God himself. And then to get to Constantine really quickly, I think that Constantine's influence on the, the prevalence and rise of Christianity can't be minimized, but it tends to be a little bit over over maximized or over exaggerated. Right, right. It's not nearly what people think it is. Constantine's one of these names that people say, oh, Constantine. Like they attribute almost like these, these like this influence. Yes, he's the Roman emperor. And so he's got tremendous power and influence, but there's a little too much being said about how much Constantine did to shape the Christian faith. Remember, Constantine became a convert in the in, in, in the fourth century. So we're talking about hundreds of years of Christianity mm -hmm. spread. Um, east and West, and you still have the East to contend with too, because the Eastern part of Christianity is 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 strong, and there's tradition there that we have. It's in, we focus on the Western way far too much, mm -hmm. um, or not far too much. We focus on it to the detriment of understanding an Eastern tradition mm -hmm. as well. So we give Constantine more credit than he's or blame, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, well, it's, and it, it seems to me too. Typically, what people blame. Constantine for it really didn't take place until uh, Theodosius pretty fairly soon after him and then it was back and forth but yeah he was kind of trying to keep an empire together he wasn't really interested in sort of doing a lot of the thing but Christians and non-Christians alike point to him as as this almost this like scapegoat for yeah. every bad whatever we find bad in Christianity started then yeah um, whether it's the uh, you know oppression of other cultures or uh the militarization of christianity or or yeah. whatever it is and and there are there are hints of truth to that yeah um but, but not over exaggerated sometimes yeah. uh, rodney stark has in um, uh his book the, the rise of, or the triumph of christianity in his book he talks about constantine quite a bit and he says what's interesting is that constantine did not try to actually squash or crush paganism um <clears throat> Because he actually allowed for a freedom of religious expression within pagan within pagan strands, and he allowed for the diversity of it. Well, Constantine, according to Stark, was actually far more um, uh, strict on was Christian orthodoxy. He did not mm -hmm. want Christian orthodoxy to become this weird amalgam of a bunch of weird things. Yeah. And so while not himself being a religious authority, I think he relied on some and was very nervous about the creeping in of the pagan with the Christian. So I think in some senses, he was actually nervous of the opposite. Yeah. Not, not, not 100%, <laughs> of course, not 100%. But um, Stark points out that Constantine was much harder on Christians compromising their beliefs mm -hmm. than he was on pagans exercising their beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. I want to point real quick to something you might find um, interesting on this question. Um, Augustine was on record actually making fun of, I believe, Romans mm -hmm. for celebrating birthdays. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems so bizarre that they would have this. So it is this sort of, and, and in the East, mm -hmm. we, and I know you mentioned it in the, um, in this episode, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times in the East, they celebrate Christmas technically on January 6th yeah, because this tradition had developed that um, Jesus was 
crucified nine months after he was conceived. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, or, or sorry, Jesus was crucified on the same day he was conceived. Yeah. So through dating that, they say nine months after his crucifixion date, which they say is April 6th, and the West they say is March 25th, is either December 25th or yeah. January 6th. Yeah. Um, so there are sort of these uh, dual traditions and mm-hmm. which one we don't really know which one uh, yeah. uh, actually gets us there. But now scholars think, yeah, maybe April or August or some other date for the actual yeah the actual birth date but um and just a, a, a sort of a denouement to this to, to the Christmas question um is um some say okay well if there's no real biblical backing for celebrating this particular day mm-hmm. then why do we do it <clears throat> isn't it giving in to like a pagan influence and I, my, my answer is that um you can celebrate the Lord's birth on any day in fact we, we should celebrate his birth essentially mm-hmm. on any day and if you pick a day where the the meaningfulness of it and, and uh not the consumerism but the pageantry is involved where we're making much of our lord's birth why wouldn't you do that why wouldn't we celebrate the birth of the savior of the world so it happens to be on december 25th we don't know what day it actually was and so you celebrate it every day but we shout it to the world yeah evangelistically and then of course we have this devotional time of celebrating the lord's birth why wouldn't we do it so december 25th fine but you know what do it on december 26th too and january 6th and january 13th and february 18th and whatever other days you can think of to celebrate the lord's (laughs) birth but let's you know I, i think that we don't have a taboo against it um, so if we can make much of our Lord and the world is listening, let's make much of our Lord when the world is listening. Yeah. That's what they were doing with, with why, why they picked though, that time. Yeah. Anyway. The world was listening to spiritual things and they say that which you are thinking gives you answers. Don't, but that which can give you answers actually happened. And so they shouted at a time when the world was listening mm-hmm. and that's what Christmas can do for us. We can shout at a time when the world is listening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Abdu. we've got, um, uh let's see what well real quick philip asks what do you think is the most widely used myth in this claim boy it kind of shifts it does shift it does because <laughs> you said that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a great video by the way um and there's a number of these videos uh so there's a channel on youtube called lutheran satire um and the most famous video they have is uh, St. Patrick's Bad Analogies for the Trinity. <laughs> and it has Connell and Donnelly's two. It's a cartoon, by the way. And it's downright hilarious. Um, uh, and I think their, their motto is defending of the faith by making fun of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether or not you're okay with satire and whether or not it gets a little too far and makes fun of certain people and all this, they do have a video. Uh, I think it's called Osiris Ruins Easter or something like that. And it goes through all these different, so it starts off with, uh, or Horus ruins Easter. So there's all these different iterations of the same argument. Jesus is a parallel to Mithra. Jesus is a parable to Osiris. Jesus is a parallel to Horus. Jesus is a parallel to, and you just sort of pick a God that you have some kind of loose belief that there was, oh, there's 12 people who follow him. Oh, that's a parallel. And so you start to create parallels that don't actually exist. Um, and so the video points out, quite funny, but it points out that every time you dispel one, another one pops up. So all these little gods keep popping up, um, or these these mythical gods keep popping up in this church to try to ruin Christmas or try to ruin Easter. And the Lutheran pastor basically puts them down into the point where they have to disappear. Um, and I, I won't give the punchline away, but there is a, uh, a fictional um, uh, mythical being who arrives who is part of a a comedy, one of the greatest comedies of all time. Uh, so do tune into the video. It's hilarious uh, <laughs> if you get a chance to watch it. But um, the point is that it shifts. And so Mithra is popular for a while until Mithra is debunked. And then Osiris is popular for a while until Osiris is debunked. And, um, and Horus, and you go through these various gods, and then eventually they just cycle them back again. It's like, oh, we yeah. have more information on this. Well, the more information we have on these various myths, the more we realize they either post-date Christianity, mm-hmm. so the influence is actually Christianity influences those ideas, or there's no real parallels at all. So yeah. um, look out for Myth- Mithra, look out for Osiris. Um, those those are yeah. the two I think are the, probably the most common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask to, uh, you know, as we're kind of 
so you were talking about satire mm -hmm. and it's hard to sometimes respond to someone who is smart and satirical uh, but they claim to have this sort of grasp on the truth which is a lot of what bill Maher, we've responded to bill maher um a few times now yeah. and um he sort of it, it kind of shows that how you you can be sort of a, a really intelligent well-read mm -hmm. person yet these things um, I know you talked last week on, or two weeks ago on deliberations about sort of, uh, in the all rise before that on um, confirmation bias. Yeah. And uh, how would you? I know we got a question in the chat on, um, you know, if you're in a conversation with someone like Bill Maher, this is from uh, Leah. Mm -hmm. You're in a conversation with someone like Bill Maher who's aggressively and sort of shaming, openly mocking you. What is the best tactic? To sort of break through some of that mm -hmm. and be able to just have a serious conversation. Um, yeah. Uh, well, let me say um, a couple of things, and it kind of depends on the context in which you're having this conversation and your friendship with that person. Um, if you have a relationship with that person and you know that they're kind of um, smart alecky and that's sort of the way they talk, and it's not really a defense mechanism, it's just the mm -hmm. way they talk. Uh, if you're a little bit smart, I'll keep back with them as long as you've got a strong relationship. That's okay. They, they might respond <laughs> yeah. to it really, really well. They might yeah. respect it, actually. Yeah. Um, but, of course, not, not a lot of us are gifted at this, and some people are very gifted at it. And so our attempt to actually do it well sort of backfires because it's like, ah, uh, they can pull it off and I can't pull it off, and so it looked bad or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to recommend a book, though, and I've recommended this book a lot of times. Uh, and, in fact, I've had him on the show uh, Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason has a wonderful book called Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Um, and I had a whole episode, uh, two episodes, I believe, actually, with Greg on in season one of All Rise about his book. And one of the tactics he talks about is um, how do you actually diffuse a situation when you have a steamroller, someone who will not stop talking or is more of a sort of a verbal bully, or if you have somebody who's a little snarky and these kind of things and how you do that. Um, at some point, it might be the case that you need to stop the conversation and say, hold on a second, can you be serious for a moment? Because I'm having a hard time uh, figuring out whether or not you're taking this seriously or you think it's all a big joke. Um, and I'm not saying you need to shame someone into, stop into stopping. I'm just saying that for your own sense, maybe it's time to yeah. say, you know what, I get it, but this is important. Well, it, well you know, and would you say, you know, if you're not really interested in the truth, I'm under no obligation to try and yeah. give it to you. If you're really just going to take this as a joke and you don't care, mm -hmm. um, and anything I say, you're not going to believe no matter what. I mean, it, at what level would you say you don't engage? You're under no obligation to engage, mm -hmm. or do you try and plant a seed, or how do you... Well, and if you're wrestle with that, yeah, and I think that this is this is the point of praying both before and during mm -hmm. a, an encounter where you can yeah. ask the Lord for guidance and wisdom on this, because there is no formula. Obviously, it's like when they've been snarky with you five times, well, that's enough, you know. <laughs> or it's uh, you know, on average, three point one times per conversation, they tend to be snarky, and so you when, when it's four, you realize it, they, you can't do that. Yeah. Um. So it's got to be a matter of in the moment, and are they getting defensive? Sometimes you can point it out. It's like, look. We're getting to the point now where the amount of this is suggesting to me that you actually don't want to hear it or you're trying mm -hmm. to avoid or deflect. Um, and if you'd rather do that and let's talk about sports or something else, I'm fine with that. Um, and in, in doing so, by the way, you can actually point out something important that you don't have to say with words, but maybe the person hears it as like, I really, really, really don't want to talk about this because I'm getting a little too uncomfortable. And so sometimes mm -hmm. that satire or that sarcasm can arise because it's getting a little too close to the mark. I'm not saying every time, but sometimes. And so there is biblical precedent, by the way, for the whole idea of walking away from a situation or pointing out someone's motives. Um, the rich young ruler, of course, he asks a question seeking to justify himself. Jesus says, here's the ways we, if, you, if you're totally righteous with all these things, you can... The guy gets all happy with himself that I've done all these things since birth. And then Jesus says, well, you lack one thing. And the Bible actually says something interesting in Mark. It says, and Jesus, loving him, said, you mm -hmm. lack one thing. Mm -hmm. Go sell all you have and then come follow me. Um, and that was a loving thing to do. He yeah. pointed out, you're saying a whole lot of stuff and you're really happy with yourself. But <laughs> you, not yeah. everybody, you, sir, need to get rid of everything and follow me because you're holding on to too many things. Mm. Um, and the guy walked away sad and Jesus let him. 
another time, you know, they come and they ask them, the Pharisees, or the, I can't remember if it's Pharisees, Sadducees, or one of the other Assis mm -hmm. um, uh, in, the, in, in the New Testament. And the scribes come and ask Jesus, you know, who do you think you are? And what authority do you have to do these things? And Jesus asks them a, com a question back. And he says, you know, John's, got, John's uh, baptism, was it from God or from men? And now they're stuck in a quandary because he knows they've debated and they know that they care more about what people think about them than the actual truth mm -hmm. of um, John's authority, which means right. if they don't care about John's authority, they certainly don't care about Jesus's authority. Right. And so they say, I don't know. And Jesus says, yeah, well, I'm not going to tell you anyway, because you don't care to know. Um, and that's there's biblical precedent for doing that. Does that mean that you know exactly when to do it? No um always but sometimes you just trust that you have here's my advice stay in the conversation a little longer than you'd like to if you think this is going nowhere mm. because you might get surprised yeah and yeah. if it if you stay a little longer don't worry you're not going to overcook the meat it, it'll be it'll be fine <laughs> um stay a little longer and then say you know what i'm, I'm withdrawing from this you can do that there's a time to do that but if someone likes and appreciates sarcasm and snark um, or satire, there's there's resources out there where the yeah. sat satire uh, appears uh, for the Christian faith and, and in favor of the Christian faith. But you got to be careful because satire, people who tend to be satirical, um, uh, once in a while they have a thinner skin than they want you to have. Mm -hmm. So you got to be careful with that too. Don't just... Yeah respond that way as well so you have to be careful it's always I, I wish i had a formula for you i wish i really wish i did because i could use it for myself right um but i don't <laughs> uh it's a matter of prayer it's a matter of feel it's a matter of relationship yeah 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 and and um be comfortable with if you feel like you've made a mistake after go into it being okay with the idea that you might make something you consider a mistake and don't let that stop you from engaging absolutely um, beforehand and if you've hurt their feelings with satire or, or or whatever it is have the humility and have the 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 sense of a gospel urgency to apologize for yeah, it yeah, yeah yeah amen yeah um well real quick i just want to remind everyone we're a little over halfway through the show it, uh feel free to share this with all of your friends and whenever we go live share it beforehand invite people to it who who may be interested in these questions. I know we're getting ready to get to a question from Anne Marie, who invites her friends uh, to watch. Hey, and we, we get to have fun conversations and, and will soon. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead and do that and make sure you're subscribed so you get notification every time we go live. Mm -hmm. um, now, to, to Anne Marie's question, yeah. a very good one. Uh, how would you answer claims about Jesus being influenced by Buddha or? Uh, that things like the Nag Hammadi library are probably actually what Jesus said and are, uh, quote unquote, uncorrupted, unlike the gospels in the canon. Well, um, so if I understand it correctly, uh, Emery, what you're asking essentially is, um, uh, how can we point out that Jesus wasn't influenced by whether it's Buddha or Krishna? Because there is some claim, by the mm -hmm. way, that there's a parallel between Krishna and Christ. <laughs> and, you have this sort of idea that Hinduism is lodged firmly within mm -hmm. uh, Christianity in some way or its development or, or some such thing, or the Nag Hammadi. Now, yeah. the Nag Hammadi is interesting because yeah. it's it's anachronistic. The the you can't one could have, would have a hard time arguing that Jesus was influenced by the Nag Hammadi, uh, given the fact that we're pretty sure that um, uh, I don't know if anybody. Who argues that Nag Hammadi was co was contemporary co contemporary with Jesus, right, historically right. speaking? Yeah, so no. you you wouldn't have that influence. Uh, now, one might argue that Christianity, in terms of the religious movement, was influenced by it, and that kind of thing. But if you're to say that the Nag Hammadi is more actually um, original than the Gospels mm -hmm. were, you have a very serious dating problem because no one argues that the Gospels came after Nag Hammadi in mm -hmm. some way. Um, or that Jesus was contemporaneous with the Nag Hammadi stuff, that's much later. Well, I, I do wonder if, what, what someone could say, just to make this more difficult for mm -hmm. us, is, well, the Nag Hammadi has certain uh, writings with a Gnostic influence yeah. that, that, are, that are meant to show um, this tradition of secret knowledge that was suppressed by the church. Yeah. And that secret knowledge 
looks very Gnostic, which means Jesus must have been influenced by Gnostic teachers and, mm -hmm. and these sorts of things that you can find parallels for and other. So, oh, here we have again this, this thing where um, the real Jesus mm -hmm. that we find in there that the church suppressed is influenced by these other, uh, you know, groups that may have been around at the time. So maybe it's like another form of Jesus being influenced by. So it's, you know, it's, it's either Buddha or some sect that is represented in, you know, the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, or something that yeah. is, is included in that library. Yeah. And, and this goes right back to, um, how, can you actually tie this historically? You can make the claim all you want. But the question is, can you actually tie this in some way, historically speaking, or is this, is this church, this nascent church, which didn't have a whole lot of time to basically concoct this thing and get rid of all the competition, uh, botch it, um, or, or sorry, not botch it, but do so well in covering their tracks that there's no trace of linking the Nag Hammadi materials to Jesus himself originally or whatever. I mean, to say that Jesus is influenced by Buddha because you see some parallels in some way, whereas there's an asceticism or a withdrawal or a retreat, that's just a theme. It doesn't mean that there's a parallel. Um, uh, the I got, idea that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu, and therefore there is an incarnational aspect of Christianity, and that influence, that's just a, a parallel theme. But the idea of the incarnation of Vishnu in Krishna is so different than the idea of God the Son taking on human flesh and keeping both his mm -hmm. divine and his human uh, I'm sorry, keeping his divine and taking on the human and emptying himself and the kenosis, that's not the same thing. You have a million different things now that are so different. So if you're going to make the claim that they influence each other, it's not enough to say there are similar themes. You have to actually make a, I think, hopefully, if, if you were if you were to be serious about it, a documentary um, mm -hmm. connection. Now, if one says, well, the documentary connection was suppressed and gone and, and, and ruined by the church. Really? Then why are there not Gamada materials at all? Yeah. They didn't do they, they, they managed to get rid of everything linking this stuff to 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 Jesus um and propagating a false thing, except this one thing. They mm -hmm. botched that one. That one they yeah. didn't get. So it's it smacks a lot of conspiracy theory the, uh theorists that um will get around the lack of evidence by saying you would expect a lack of evidence to happen. You're now, right. <laughs> um, so yeah. now is that always wrong? No, it's not always wrong. That, mm -hmm. that does in fact happen. There's times when in fact a lack of evidence is there because there's been a suppression of it. But um, believing that this, this, the conspiracy is true eventually comes out because you can't suppress all of it. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to think about this. We live in a day and age, a digital day and age, where we can wipe out things um, and do all kinds of suppression of evidence and all this stuff. And evidence still bubbles to the surface. It yeah. still does. So you're talking 2,000 years ago, people who had only writing and horses at best, maybe a ship that can get you from one place to another, and you're going to erase all this connection um, when you have com whole communities of people mm -hmm. who can persist in this tradition and there's nothing, at least nothing credible. Uh, early enough to link this stuff when you have the exact opposite, by the way, where you have a much earlier gospel tradition that is nothing like the Gnostic tradition at all. So I think you have two things to think about. You have a lack of evidence um, connecting any Gnostic tradition to Jesus. And you have, uh, and you can't say, well, of course, because it was destroyed. Well, you have a positive case because all the actual evidence early on in the Christian faith documented about what Jesus actually said and did. So I'm going to go with what I have, not with what might have been there, but it's gone now. Maybe if you can prove that. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes some kind of sense. But I think that the lack of evidence cannot be conveniently brushed away because you'd say, well, of course, there's a lack of evidence because mm -hmm. the church rewrote history. Yeah. Well, it didn't rewrite it later. It wrote that history pretty early yeah and you have this tradition the chain of custody we talked about before where you have early church fathers and these traditions that go back and back and back and back where the message is consistently the same so if you're going to look at the preponderance of evidence or even the great weight of evidence the great weight of evidence is definitely against any idea that nagamadi 
um, or these other influences really influenced the Christian faith uh, in any way that made it a spurious or a um, sort of amalgamation of other things. Yeah. You know, I think the Christian faith has tons of positive evidence in its favor. So if I'm going to take a look at a lack of evidence and a mountain of positive evidence, I'm going with the positive evidence, yeah. not the supposed lack of evidence. Well, and to kind of go back to a point that uh, Gregory made earlier, if they had no problem with saying that their savior, who was also God mm. uh, and a man, died, I don't think they'd have much of a problem with saying if it really happened. Oh, yeah. And Jesus traveled to Kashmir and heard some cool things and came back. I mean, that yeah. that seems... And one is way more insurmountable of an yeah. obstacle than the other. Yeah, and they have no incentive. If you think about it, there's no real incentive of the early church to put down sort of uh, anything Gnostic at all um, if it weren't true. Like yeah. it, it wouldn't take away from, <clears throat> except for the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but they defended this bodily resurrection of Jesus based on the, the eyewitness testimony. So a Gnostic might think that, the, you know, the, the idea of the flesh um, it is it, the flesh is dirty and evil and filthy and what really matters is only spirit and the christians uh came about and said no 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 we, we need to have the the flesh mean something uh which so we're going to lie about jesus being physically resurrected why they, yeah. there's no reason to, to 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 care about the physical versus the the spiritual if you're so hellenized if you're so paganized that you are willing to be Gnostic. Why not be Gnostic? They didn't need to combat this unless mm -hmm. they're saying, no, this is what the testimony has been. Jesus was physically resurrected. And that's not the main part of Gnosticism, but it's a part of it. So they wouldn't have any reason to combat it. Okay, well, the, um, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that we may talk about hell later on. Yeah. We've received too many good questions. All right. So we will, <laughs> we, I hope to get to hell. Yeah. One day, but we've got some live well, you, questions you, you here. You hope that, that we address Oh, us. yes. You don't hope let me, there. let me yeah. clarify. <laughs> yeah. Um, oops. Oops. Indeed. Mm. I hope no one pulls that out. Look yeah. at what Embrace the Truth is teaching. Um <laughs> So, uh, but there, there were uh, a couple more I want to get to live questions, and we'd like to prioritize those. Mm -hmm. um, Don Hayes asks, uh, I'm confused about in the Garden of Eden, the snake is used as evil, but with Moses, the snake is used as symbolic of Jesus and healing. And he has, had, you know, have you noticed this? What do you make of this snake um, symbolism here? Well, that's a good question. And I, I've actually, I've actually thought about it. I, I can't tell you that I thought about it in tremendous amounts of depth, but I have once in a while, you know, these are the kind of things that happen when you read your Bible. You're like, why is a snake suddenly something important here, but it's not important, but it's actually considered the opposite in another sense. Um, and I guess my, my first answer is, is that, you know, I have a rule, by the way, is that where the Bible does not speak, I will not shout. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I get nervous about trying to, to answer why questions on scripture without a clear indication of why a, the, a, the, a serpent can be a symbol of good and of evil, depending on the context, except to say it depends on the context. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the context in which case the, the, the people were, the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were bitten by serpents. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, yeah. the idea here is that a something was is raised up. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like if you look at the instrument of death mm -hmm. and, and, and evil, in some sense, that is what will will save you. Which does have some interesting symbolism then, because mm -hmm. the because John points out the the you know, Moses is doing holding up this snake on the cross. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's something. Well, that's interesting that you say that. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, if we go back to the garden and the symbol of uh, or the way in which the sort of enfleshment, so to speak, uh, or the personification of the temptation of Adam and Eve to veer from what God himself has for them in terms of their purpose and their desire for autonomy and the temptation and all this, and that's the fall of all humanity. And of course, you move on crushing of the head and all that stuff mm -hmm. and the heel. Um, and then you have this incident where the people are dying from snake bites. Um, and then he hold up the snake. Um, it, it, you know, one could read into it very, very easily that God is in the business of redeeming 
or using that which is of death or actual life. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a foreshadow of what's to come because it's like that. In fact, the Bible specifically says, it's just as the serpent, I can't remember where it is in the Bible. Shoot, I'm going to miss this. Um, where um, there's a parallel drawn between the symbol that's raised and um, yeah. the cross or, G or the Son of Man is being raised as a symbol, as the fulfillment of the type and shadow that was before it. So um, I'm forgetting the reference, sorry, but um, there yeah, is this sense. John 3.14, yeah. just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man who believe well and there you go I mean, yeah. Yeah. while that's not a direct it's, it's, it's a direct <laughs> reference to it but it say specifically right. that, um, yeah. the symbol here is referencing the symbol of garden mm -hmm. but there is at least some sense in which that which seems to be evil or bring death like a Roman cross torture instrument yeah God is going to use for the salvation of the world, just as God used a symbol of humanity's fall to foreshadow what God had done by by using it as an instrument of salvation for the, for the Hebrew. Um, so I think a good argument can be made that way. Um, is it explicit? No, but is it strongly implied? Good argument can be made that strongly implied. Yeah. I like that. Um, so uh -huh. let's see. So we've got, um, I want to get to a couple more if we have time. And actually, uh, Sam is asking a lot of good questions. And so hell, thank you after all. Okay. Um, but, hell uh, and uh, yeah, we have shared, I think maybe uh, Lance may have shared, we have, uh, I missed it, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have we have responded to Bill Maher talking about slavery. There's some uh, people wanting to know if we responded before. Um, and someone, uh, someone asked about Bill Maher and his uh Comments on slavery in the yep. Bible. So we have responded to that, and I think yeah. I think Lance uh, linked that in the chat. Yep, and I have a whole book. Oh yeah, I have a whole book. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is great. Um, but uh, Sam also asked, he's kind of going, if you don't want to take the initial stab at this, if Easter is a pagan religion, uh, should we celebrate that also? And people often point that up because they have found this oh, this pagan ritual of Eostre, mm -hmm. and you know, it sounds kind of like Easter, but um, that's uh, almost entirely made up. What everyone has said about this Eostre, we know almost nothing about it. It yeah. may have just been a, you know, a, a, a certain, what they call it, a certain monster day of the week, and we literally have no idea. It comes from a, a mention from the Venerable Bede. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also, again, uh, Easter is based off something that happened during Passover, which already existed, and the symbolism of Easter already existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as it being based on the word Yostre, mm -hmm. uh, uh, half of the world does now, has always called it Pascha. They've never called it Easter. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So there are some sort of feeders mm -hmm. of uh, that. Um, now, again, it may be that some of the ritual, you know, the Easter eggs and things like that yeah. may have, we don't really know exactly where they come from, but that's the point. We we don't know. There's no direct links to very so um I don't know if you've ever sort of um dove into the, the the Easter question, but it's another one of these um sort of conspiratorial things of again, this is all based on blank blank, you know, blah blah blah. This is this is I think it's really important because um, it's a, I have looked into it, and it was another one is Ishtar, you know, and it, yeah, yeah, Ishtar, so right. like Easter yeah. and all that. And you see that there's, there's almost no connection beyond they sound the same. <laughs> um, and um, what you don't have is Christians calling it Easter by that name that would sound like Ishtar mm -hmm. early on. Yeah. Um, so if you're talking about parallels later, um, and this is important. People, I don't want to ascribe motive to people I don't know. However, there is a tendency when you look at online conspiracy theories or you look at um, various ideas where someone wants to see something more behind something 
or find a nefarious purpose or undermine something or challenge the established narrative. Now, I'm not against challenging the established narrative, but when people are desperate to find something that can be a unique challenge to the established narrative, they'll find a parallel wherever they can find it. Uh, one guy called it parallel with Aenea. Um, you'll find something and you'll hold on to anything. And what ends up happening is um, ironic because there's a bit of a telephone connection. Easter sounds like Ishtar. Ishtar and the myth of Ishtar suddenly have all these parallels to Easter. But does it? Really, we start adding these things, just like the Osiris and the Christa. This idea that they had 12 disciples on December 25th and died and rose again. Turns out none of those parallels actually exist. If they exist, they exist at most. They had disciples. How many? You know, disciples like. And did they proclaim death was be redemptive? None of that's true. You see these names, um, it sounds similar. You, you, you jump up and you start to create or believe other people's parallels without researching it yourself. This is why movies like the Zeitgeist movie had to have a part two because the first one was the spin, so therapy. Um, the reason why I say you have to be careful is not just because when you're Christian and you see these things come in, you say, the Ostra thing, we almost know nothing about this. And so it's easy when you know nothing to make up stuff because right, yeah. there'll be truth. You, can't, you yeah. can't falsify. In other words, you can't falsify it. And so claims have to be falsifiable. For them to be, not they don't have to be, but the best claims are those that can be falsified if they were false. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it's an objective standard to judge it by. If you have this nebulous, maybe it's like that, maybe it's not. I, the reason why I say be careful is because I think Christians can sometimes do this. Human beings can do this when we want to find parallels with things that actually aren't parallel because it's sort of sound similar or it's been some meeting point thing that doesn't actually exist. I can't think of an example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to caution all of us um, not to try to find parallels where they don't exist to learn something, but also mm -hmm. don't try to find parallels where they don't exist so you can strengthen something you Truth will be strong on it. Yeah. Um, so I want to uh, apologize. It looks like, it sound, looks like we're having some sound issues. Some people have mentioned our mic getting in and out. So oh, um, hopefully uh, we may have, I don't know if we're getting another, we may have a, a file of this that we'll be able to post afterwards. Yeah. Have clean sound. But um, okay. hopefully people can uh, hear us now and uh the, the last question and there's a lot more comments now uh <laughs> underneath so i as we we uh we've had a lively uh crowd today um but uh, uh the question is i had a conversation with my aunt who believes people who go to hell can get out over time uh how can i respond to that so perhaps his aunt is catholic and mm -hmm. you know they have, the, they have the idea of purgatory but mm -hmm. um i want to tie this into what I talked about at the beginning. You had a reel come out talking about hell, why people actually go to hell. You say they don't go to hell for believing the wrong things. They go to hell because they're sinners, and that's an important distinction. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were sort of pushing back. There is this sort of constant human desire to somehow soften the blow uh, of hell mm -hmm. and say, well, it either doesn't exist or um, – or you get you can get out over time, mm -hmm. or, or or something like that. And um, mm -hmm. by the way, we did have a comment uh, on YouTube saying, uh, "Someone asked, I wonder why Christians believe in in hell. It's not in the Old Testament at all." And we could say quickly, Christians believe in hell because it's very much in the New Testament. But, yeah, um, Jews don't believe in it. Uh, they say the worst you suffer is relieving all re reliving all your shameful moments. At most, you'll be shamed for twelve months and then come back to. Uh, you'll be out of hell. And there is, um, again, that's not entirely true. Jews did believe, and uh, traditions did develop believing in an eternal uh, hell of some sort. Yeah. Um, in Jewish traditions also, um, so, but, but you see even in Jewish traditions that develop, there is this, there really is that idea of after 12 months, most of them will be good, although some of them maybe won't be. Mm -hmm. um, but you see this idea of like being separated from God forever. Mm -hmm horrifies people mm -hmm. um even if you don't believe you think it's so horrible that you have to post that nobody goes anywhere mm -hmm. um so yeah. stop worrying about it yeah. what, do you, what do you think that 
is, and I know there's a specific question we want to talk about about can you get out over time, mm-hmm. but um, what do you think that is within the, the the human heart that even if you don't believe, you would still feel so strongly about it? Um, I, well, I think part of it is because we have a, um, and it's part of our, our everyday experience. I mean, legally speaking, uh, you know, the, the the sentence should fit the crime, and so the question becomes like, should you have uh, an eternal punishment for a temporal crime, uh, even if that crime is rejection of the Almighty. I want you to think about this for a second, though. Is that really a temporal crime? You did it in time, but it's not about the quantity of the sin. It's the quality of the sin. It's the depth of what that sin actually is. Mm-hmm. Is that when you think about what you are doing, it's not that you have sinned and therefore go to hell because you did this one action. Yes, I did say that people go to hell because they're sinners. But what does it mean to be a sinner? It doesn't mean it isn't someone who does a wrong action once in a while and is sorry about it later. It's someone who literally says, uh, and their wrong actions are a symptom of this, is that I don't need God. I am him, or I can decide what's right for my life, and I will stand on my own righteousness either before a God mm-hmm. who I think will have to will owe me heaven, or I don't even believe heaven even exists. And you're given that time to, and then you're sealed at that time when that judgment comes. Um, so you're not standing before God as someone who's got some red in their ledger. Um, you're standing as somebody who has a ledger that is that is fundamentally red, and you put it there, and you want it, and you want to say, this is my ledger, and you should be proud of this thing. Um, and you ask God to be proud. That's, that's a completely different, it's a different, it's a, it's a different set of what you actually are. Um, so, but we want to justify ourselves. This is part of what the Bible says is the human problem is that we want to justify ourselves. And so when we say, hold on, no one can be as bad as to warrant an eternal hell, or God can't be as holy as to allow for an eternal hell. Um, one of those two things is happening where I'm saying God is too good for, for hell to be eternal, or we're not bad enough for hell to be eternal. Yeah. But what if God is infinitely holy, and we aren't? Then actually, what, what's so what 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 is conceptually so pro, so problematic about it? It's our visceral reaction to it, because partly, and I think it's what with everybody, we all have loved ones. We wonder to ourselves, how could this possibly be? Now, I think again, I, I, I tread on some ground here because the possibility exists that I'm wrong about this, but why isn't it possible? Because we do have in the Bible, by the way, different levels of rewards in heaven. Mm-hmm. And we do have different levels of punishment. I mean, Jesus says things like, it's um, that certain people for certain sins, it's worse for them, for their attitudes, that's worse for them. So the different levels of punishment in hell. And the fundamental baseline punishment is separation from God's holiness and the communion with him, which is what our soul is created for. So why couldn't it be the case then that if you have somebody who's a pretty good guy by our standards and just doesn't, he's just, you know, I'm a pretty good guy and, I, and if God exists, he'll let me into heaven and maybe he doesn't exist at all. And so, you know what, I'm just gonna live my life and who cares? That person versus, you know, a horrible, horrible cheat, liar, thief, rapist, whatever it is, I would expect there to be, because the Bible suggests it, different levels of punishment. Would it be the case then that the person who is a pretty good guy by our standards, but is of course infinitely less than God, um, experiences that torment of being separated from God and it's stretched out over eternity? So if you have, I mean, a rough analogy, if you had um, a tank of torment Mm -hmm. and it's full, and you were to say, you're going to sip from that tank for the rest of eternity. Um, and I'm going to stretch it out for as long as I can. But this guy's tank is, you know, infinitely bigger. And he's going to sip from it. He's going to gulp from it for all of eternity. Why couldn't it be that someone could actually feel that torment, that lack of God, in a, in a way that's mitigated over the course of eternity, um, such that they don't feel the same as someone who's done something worse? Does that mean that they're not feeling that torment for eternity? No, it, they still feel it. It's just, it's just um, uh, distributed out over eternity in a, in a different, a different measure or a different proportion. 
Um, I think heaven will be that way. I think there'll be people who will be in heaven who will be gulping from the blessings uh, almost to the point where it's 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 overwhelming the, the blessings for all of eternity, and there'll be those for whom they sip from it, but they're still grateful for it. Um, I think that's part of what we think of hell as one size fits all, and it's all for eternity, and so we bristle at it. But I think the, our rejection of hell is ultimately a part of what makes us self-aggrandizing in the first place. We can't be so bad as to warrant that, and God can't be so. Um, vindictive as to give it to us. But hell is just the consequences of our actions. And by the way, hell gives dignity to our actions. Because on this earth, what we do matters, and it matters into eternity. If there was no hell, then I think that our actions wouldn't matter. Um, if there was no heaven, then in a sense, our actions wouldn't matter. But our actions here do matter, not just for the foreseeable future of the universe, um, which would eventually just stop working, it matters into eternity. That is the ultimate statement of dignity. Yeah, it gives dignity to our to our actions, good or bad. Yeah, the the idea about us getting out of getting out of hell. Um, again, this goes back to what the Bible doesn't speak. We ought not shout. Um, <clears throat> I I can see no per- personally. I can see no biblical warrant for the idea that anything like hell or hellish is temporary. Mm-hmm. I just don't see it. Old or New Testament. Um, <clears throat> uh, I see evidence to the contrary where I see um, the, par- the, the, par- the um, parable of Lazarus and the rich man, where Jesus says there's this rich man and there's this beggar named Lazarus, and the rich man passes by all the time. Uh, by the way, Ken Bailey does a wonderful job in his book, uh, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, of pointing out something, mm-hmm. is that, so you have this, this um, and we're running over time, so I want to be careful, I want to sort of finish, maybe <laughs> finish with this. You have this um, uh, parable where Jesus has this guy named Lazarus, who, not the Lazarus who was raised from the dead, but a guy named Lazarus who is a beggar. And then you have this rich man who passes by Lazarus every day. Now in a Middle Eastern culture, what you'd see is an honor and shame culture where the man's honor, the rich man's honor, could never be sullied by talking to this beggar. And so he shames the beggar and never actually talks to him. So he just passes by and passes by and passes by. Well, both of them die and the rich man gets what he basically asked for, which was, I'm going to rely on my riches in this life, and I have no real care for the afterlife. And so in the afterlife, he is sitting in this state of torment. But he looks up, and he can see across the chasm between heaven and hell that the, the Lazarus is, is, is resting at Abraham's bosom, which is a symbol essentially for um, a fulfillment, a, a shalom, as it were, um, uh, of being with the, 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 the ancients, as, you know, the ancients of the faith. And so what does the rich man do? This is interesting. This is what Ken Bailey points out. In an honor and shame culture, this sticks out like a sore thumb. What does the rich man do? He pleads. He says, Abraham, doesn't talk to Lazarus. He talks to Abraham. Abraham, send Lazarus to dip his finger in a river and just cool my tongue a little bit. Send Lazarus. And Abraham says, no, there's no way to cross the gulf between the two of us. That's already something interesting in and of itself. And then he says, Abraham, send Lazarus back to warn my brothers not to come to this hellish place that I'm in. And Abraham says, even if they saw someone rise from the dead, they wouldn't necessarily believe. Um, So what's interesting is, is that, as Ken Bailey points out, the rich man never talks to Lazarus. He never pleads with Lazarus. He talks to Abraham. In his life, the rich man f- f- felt disdain and nothing but pride in relation to Lazarus. And even now, when he sees that Lazarus is in the bosom of the patriarch of patriarchs, Abraham, he still scorns Lazarus. Mm. The point is, you are in hell who you chose to be in this world. Yeah. So there is no crossing over. Yeah, and it... Um it's a really good point. I also just want to point out really quickly, when Jesus talks about that, he is talking about um, even sort of, he, he is using the idea of hell as it was understood in the Old Testament. Because yeah. 
uh, Sheol was in the Old Testament. So for, yeah. for, for someone saying, oh, it's not in the Old Testament at all, mm-hmm. that vision there is largely based off of Old Testament allusions as yeah. well. So quite interesting. And his audience yeah. understood that. And his audience, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we, uh, yeah, we are a little bit over. I just, I, I do want to offer um, to anyone who, I, I'm not sure what question we were responding to when the sound went out. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, if you wanted to really hear that answer and, and didn't, uh, and uh, if, if we can't get an audio version up, then email us at, or email me at mail at embrace the truth.org, M A I L at embrace the truth.org, and just let me know and I'll get you some information that um, will answer anything that may have dropped out during the, the live stream. Yeah. Um, but thank you all. Uh, we appreciate you uh, being here and being so lively today. This was a really fun conversation, fun very action-packed, hard to keep up with you guys. So um, <laughs> that's good. But uh, yeah, thank you. And we will see you in two weeks mm-hmm. talking about, uh, I believe, authorship of the Gospels. Yes, indeed. So we'll Both see you fun. then. See you in two Tuesdays. Take care.